Okay, so today we're going to be talking about um, the cognitive revolution. We've set up all the groundwork for it with discussions of um, thinking about the mind in terms of computation and metaphor, or sorry, and information, um, as the computer is a metaphor for the mind. So now we're actually going to be talking about the cognitive revolution itself, um, some challenges to it, some current active interests, areas of interest, right? So the background information is the stuff from the previous lecture. Make sure you've gone through that and have a decent understanding of it. Then we're going to talk about integration, um, the integration challenge, how to integrate something that has so many constituent parts. Um, a lot of science is developed because there's one broad question or a combination of two uh, types of instruments or approaches that, that make something. Cognitive science has one broad question, but many, many, many instruments and many approaches. And so integrating it becomes a real question, and especially its status as a science. Does it get to count as a science? And then finally, we'll do some of my um, area of, of interest. So we might talk about Mara and Vision before, but um, talk about the article that I wrote for this class. So 1956, um, Chomsky has written this uh, takedown of behaviorism. Um, there's a computer scientist, a psychologist, and a linguist. They're all at a symposium, and they start thinking about this idea of um, minds as cognitive processes that might just be computational processes. And so um, Miller describes this later as uh, it was a, a strong conviction and it was more intuitive than rational um, that there was a way of integrating everything that everybody was talking about in a single paradigm. So um, the cognitive revolution uh, relates to some of these developments. In the last video, we talked about <clears throat> memory and information and thinking about it in informational terms uh, suddenly opened up the possibility of, of uh, talking about what was going on in the mind. Um, and we also talked about uh, language, right? How there might be innate uh, ideas or perhaps innate grammar. We've talked about some of the objections of behaviorism is that there are some hierarchical approaches. If we start thinking about linguistic um, learning language as algorithmic, um, and we use some of the uh, metaphors from computation and, and uh, information theory, then all of a sudden we can develop information processing models of cognition. And this was the revolution, right? This was a new way of thinking about the mind that didn't seem to fall victim to the same objections that the behaviorists had to mentalist approaches. It wasn't um, as simplistic as like a lobotomizing approach. Um, and it wasn't as um, reductive and, and eliminativist as uh, a behaviorist approach. So what is cognitive science? Um, and actually, depending on who you ask, you might get different answers. Um, but it is at least an integrative study, uh, integrating lots of different approaches of perception, attention, thinking, language, conscious volition, uh, or action anyway, consciousness, emotion, imagination, thinking about thinking, and so much more. Right? Um, if you try to unify this into a slogan, you might say, well, it's uh, an understanding of the mind, or thinking about how brains represent the world um, or themselves using information to respond to the environment, understanding cognition, like all of these would be slogans that would miss something, but would capture some aspect of cognitive science. Um, so we've talked about thinking about um, cognition, cognition as information processing. Um, and if cognition isn't, is, uh, based on information processing, then you might even develop um, algorithmic computer type rule based approaches to, to learning uh, in your environment, right? Um, another consequence of thinking about cognition as information is that 
information is sensitive to how it is processed and how it is stored, um, which means that uh, the different senses, the different ways of organizing are all subject to their own investigation in cognitive science. Um, unlike the mentalist approach, which is just like pay attention to your internal subjectivity, um, and this is the same with structuralism and, and, and functionalism, pay attention to how you think you process the world. No, we can actually just do studies to see whether we can learn more um, when exposed to sounds or smells or whatever. So there are challenges, and this semester we'll talk about all of these. Um, cognitive science was a dominant approach, and, um, and then it turned out that there might be other, or there might be things that are left out by it, right? So we might not be thinking about consciousness in the right way. So we'll dedicate a couple of weeks to thinking about consciousness and what cognitive uh, science and cognitive neuroscience could even possibly say, not what they do say, what they but could possibly say. Um, there's dynamical systems approach, which uh, holds the, the uh, view that um, the computational approach to the mind is too simplistic. The mind is actually much more dynamic. There's much more change going on constantly. And if that's true, then Thinking about it in cognitive science terms is, is a cul-de-sac, it's a fool's errand. Um, along with uh, consciousness, uh, emotion is a particularly tricky for cognitive science. So we'll talk about that this semester, um, which will connect us to embodiment, right? So the idea that cognitive science is disregarding the, the role of our bodies and uh, our extended minds in the world that will make a lot more sense later on in the semester. Um, and then finally, um, cognitive science has been thinking about the uh, human thought as kind of just like uh, information being fed to you and then processed by a machine in your head, in your brain. But there's a lot of stuff that um, is inherently interactive. So much like the embodiment Rick says, well, we might actually need to be in the world to, to think about the world. Um, we might need to be socially in the world to think about the world. And again, that will make more sense later on in the semester. There's lots and lots of different um, uh, research areas. Uh, you can see examples of these. The neuroprosthesis in particular has some really cool examples on um, in YouTube. Uh, in fact, Elon Musk just made the news by uh, arguing for neural links and, and connecting the minds to, uh, to some sort of, uh, gotta be honest, I kind of ignore everything that I, I see uh, that's developed there. But, um, but yeah, so a lot of these areas are brand new or at least super exciting and super ongoing. Um, and any one of which would be an excellent, excellent topic for a final paper. Okay. All right, so that's the cognitive revolution. Now let's get to the meat of the, the lecture today. Um, we talked about cognitive science as being multifaceted and focusing on lots of topics. How do we integrate them? Um, early on, when you talked about cognitive science, people would just show you this, this, uh, <laughs> this hexagon. You're like, well, what you've got is uh, neuroscience, which is connected to everything, but philosophy, and we have linguistics, which is connected to everything, um, and psychology, which is connected to everything. So cognitive science is like a linguistic, psychological, neuroscientific, with a, a dash of anthropology, you know, artificial intelligence, and some philosophy. Um, the idea being that uh, this is just what we focused on and there might be some justification or grounding, but it was a community that explored these issues. Um, because the mind is so complicated, it needs lots of expertise. Nobody can be an expert on everything. 
So we need uh, interdisciplinary um, people from lots of different uh, avenues of inquiry. Um, and we need to integrate them in some way. It's not obvious how to do so because every discipline wants to privilege its own discipline, right? So um, early on in cognitive science, information and computation seemed to be the, the, the paradigm that unified everything. But as time went on, um, it turned out that those had preciously little to say about neurons and about neuroscience. Um, and if we wanted to bring in neuroscience into the explanatory agenda of cognitive science, like neuroscience is largely a, a reductionist endeavor, uh, trying to explain what's going on in the mind by explaining what's going on in the brain, um, trying to incorporate neuroscience um, and not just neuroscience, but lots of other areas that we thought were going to be relevant to, to cognition. The metaphors of computation and information stopped being as useful. So what makes a science? Um, I can give you lots of answers, and in fact, I teach a class on this. But there are, here are some social features of sciences. There's an agreed upon subject matter. Uh, assumptions and jargon. Um, there is accepted cases of excellent research. What, what everybody points to is like, oh yeah, 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 that experiment, the Zucker candle and Pauling, or the uh, Einstein, uh, Eddington observation, like those are the science. And we're all, if we could get close to that, we'd be doing good science. Fruitful research questions. That is, you're not just trying to patch up holes in your, your worldview the way behaviorism and, and every other worldview that um, was eventually rejected by science um, finished their life. It's kind of sad that the most fruitful sciences end up um, dedicating the, the back chunk of their, um, their lifetime. And, and researchers in dying sciences spend so much time trying to like a patch up holes in their science. And finally, a distinctive methodology. So maybe cognitive science has a couple of these. It definitely does not have a distinctive methodology. But the agreed upon subject matter and assumptions and jargon, that's a little bit uh, up in the air. We can have an argument about that. Um, so OK. If we lacked some of those uh, features, what can we do? Um, the, the term functionalism that we're going to use here is closer to the reading from last week on philosophy of mind than it is from the reading this week. This week's reading was, um, a historical account of functionalism. So this notion of functionalism is, is more recent. And that is the view that the mental states depend on the function role, um, or embedded system rather than the details of brains, right? So you, in a functionalist view, a mind just is a function and you could have it with in a brain, you can have it in a um, computer, you can have minds in any kinds of things. Uh, we'll talk about this in more detail next week when we talk about artificial intelligence and objections to functionalism. So integration is going to be a continuous worry. Um, and we'll talk about that more in, in the next section. OK. So um, when we talk about integrating, there's a variety of ways that we could talk about it. Like We could decide that it's just not going to be in an integrated field. And it's OK. We just label it uh, a field and, and deal with it as it comes up, as the problems come up. We could decide that some topics can be integrated really well and leave open the question whether we can integrate the field altogether. Um, biochemistry, as an example, is a really good integration of biology and, and chemistry, or at least molecular biology and chemistry. Um, 
but it doesn't integrate like ecology or or inorganic chemistry, that kind of stuff. You can have global integrations, that is trying to, to ground all of um, a science together. Um, and some of these might be reductionist. You might be thinking, well, um, neuroscience is the global integration because we are appealing to brains and all minds are brains. But there's other approaches that are possible, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And finally, um, maybe there is an architecture that we could talk about that unifies everything. So the computation uh, is a mental architecture model, which we'll talk about next week. But you might also be talking, be interested in other ways of organizing the mind where um, entirely different, the role of different sciences and the role of different approaches um, becomes obvious. I hope the difference between global integrations and mental architectures makes a little bit of sense. Um, global integration is going to be more mostly uh, philosophically driven, whereas a mental architecture uh, will have one philosophical grounding, uh, but it will be, um, it'll just be a, a way of, I mean, literally think in architectural terms. It, it tells you where everything goes and what role everything plays. Uh, it does, not every bit of research has to play the same role as with global integrations. So uh, we'll focus on local integrations for the moment and completely for the rest of this class ignore that we could fail to integrate this. <laughs> um, okay. Too much in animation there. Um, so one example of local integration is MAR on vision. Um, MAR was uh, an early cognitive scientist who was, uh, studied uh, vision. And he uh, realized that there were a variety of questions that one could ask about vision. And he gave them labels, which are actually really, really terrible labels. He called them the computational uh, approach, the algorithmic approach, and the implementational approach. So the computational analysis, he, when he was talking about vision, he says, well, what is the problem? Um, and you could think about some cognitive science as trying to figure out problems that the mind is solving. Um, if you can analyze the task, you might be able to figure out why it's doing what it's doing and why it fails to do what it's uh, doing sometimes. You can identify constraints. Um, there's an algorithmic analysis which doesn't focus on what the problem is but, but what the mind is doing and ideally you have an idea of why it's trying to do that. So one is what is the goal of the mind and the other is what is it um, actually doing to reach that goal. Um, and here you might uh, pay attention to how, it, how the uh, mind fails. Um, you might start with the algorithmic analysis and say, hey, optical illusions are weird. Why do we keep falling for those? And then uh, realize that if there's systemic failures in a, a system, it might actually reveal some features of, of the system of why it was set up the way it was. Um, so when we're talking about the visual system, Marr thought that the visual system's job was to provide 3D representations of a virtual environment. Each of your eyes only gets um, lights, uh, sorry, uh, light hitting various parts of it, uh, triggers chemical reactions, and it could be perceived as a 2D um, image facing each eye. But then the mind has to put it together um, not as uh, two separate 2D images, but one global 3D image. And it has to give you a map that's independent of you so that you could close your eyes and imagine the room around you. Try that. So he did a, a lot of experiments to see if his um, analysis of, of how vision works was correct. Um, and he argued that, uh, that um, 
part of what's going on when we have uh, some abnormalities is that some of the, the steps in the visual process aren't working. And paying attention to these reveals to Mar that uh, he was right, that um, if you have certain kinds of lesions in your uh, parietal lobe, you might be uh, able to recognize or to uh, perceive shapes, but not both, um, depending on the kind of lesion. Um, and that suggests that it's an integrative, uh, your mind is, or your brain is integrating all of the evidence to try to give you an entirely uh, abstract, or at least abstracted from you as, an, as a viewer, um, experience of vision. The algorithmic approach is, is where all of the good work can get done. The computational approach, trying to figure out what the problem is, is gonna be a lot of conjecture, um, according to Mar. And the implementation approach we'll get to shortly. Um, that one is gonna be more localized. So we get the input of light arriving at the retina and you have an idea uh, and an experience of a 3D environment. And so then um, seeing that setup, you can ask these questions about like, how are we getting this information? How are we processing it? How are we rendering it? Um, Mar conjectured that it was the intensity that mattered and the uh, crossing of intense sensory input that provided us clues about how the environment worked, um, imposing patterns on reality. And he thought that the mind put together um, sketches little by little to eventually build a 3D model. Um, so it's not just your, your eyes working, your entire brain is working to perceive the world around you. Um, and you can think about objects as existing independently of your own mind. You can represent them as shapes that are, um, he is thinking in terms of cones, but you know, we can generalize this. Okay. Uh, neurobiology, you'll notice, only comes in in the third, the implementational view. How is something done? So much detail is going on at the algorithmic level. So cognitive science can just, uh, study how humans process the world or fail to and uh, investigate the algorithmic level. Um, his approach is an anti-reductionist approach that all three of these are viable approaches to experiencing and understanding vision and any problem in, um, in the mind. You don't, there's not one approach that's just better than the other. The implementation approach will give you some idea of how the brain does it, but it won't tell you why um, or what it's doing. The why, the what, and the how are these approaches. Okay, uh, this movie, or sorry, this lecture is getting a little long and I keep worrying that uh, a student that I'm meeting with is going to interrupt this, this recording. So I will um, leave the rest of this for the next video. Cheers.